With that, turn over to Luke chapter 18 today. We start an entire new series, and we're going to be in Luke chapter 18 as we go through this. And let me just sort of explain as we get started. The theme, the title of our series is Without Jesus. And as we go through this, we're going to see, I'm going to ask you to sort of examine your life and sort of look at your life. Where would your life be without Jesus? Or some of you that are older, what would your life have been if you had surrendered to Jesus younger in life? And sort of the subtitle of our message, of our series, is basically breaking good. That without Jesus or with Jesus, your life is going to pivot and going to change. So today we look at one moment. One moment in your life that completely changed your life. It was a book and it was based on this man's life. His name is Don Rogers. And the book is entitled, One Moment Changed Everything. Don Rogers uh, was an All-American for USC, was the 1983 Rose Bowl MVP. He was a first-round draft choice by the Cleveland Browns. In fact, he was Defensive Rookie Player of the Year uh, for the Cleveland Browns. And a few years later, uh, he was the day before he was about to marry his high school sweetheart, uh, signed a large contract, everything was at the very beginning of, of his whole football career. The day before he was going to marry his high school sweetheart, for some uns no reason, Don Rogers tried cocaine. And what happens with a lot of people on cocaine? His heart stopped and Don Rogers died. And the book is about that one moment changed everything. And almost the irony of it is that year, 1986, eight days before he took cocaine for the very first time and died, there's another guy who follows sports called Glenn Bias. Eight days before, who was one of the best college basketball players, second round pick in the NBA, drafted by then world champion Boston Celtics, also did the exact same thing for the very first time in his life, tried cocaine, his heart stopped, and he died. One moment, young people, will change your life. For the good or for the bad? If you're taking notes today, our sort of breaking thought that we're going to have each message is this. My life will pivot on the choices I make. My life will pivot on the choices I make. And it is so easy to blame other people for the choices that you yourself have made. The decisions you have made. But ultimately, they are your choices. They are the decisions you just, you chose to do that, you chose to start it, you chose to be involved with that group. They are decisions that you have made and your life, whether it be good or for bad, will pivot on those moments. And the scary thing about this thought is that so many of these moments happen when you're young. So many of these decisions started before you ever were 21. Some of them started in junior high. And we have so many arbitrary ages. I wrote these down. At 18, you can vote, but you can't drink. At 16, you can drive, but you can't buy cigarettes. At 18, you can die for your country, but you can't rent a car. We have so many arbitrary ages for what we decide. You can do this, you can do this. But in your life, the life-breaking moments, the direction your life will pivot on, are ageless. And so many of them happen when you're so young. Wouldn't it be great if your life came with theme music? You know, in a TV show, you know that you know he's the bad guy in a TV show or a movie because the music sort of changes and the tone gets ominous. With you know he's the bad dude. You always know on like a, a crime show, you always know who the murderer is because he's that guest star, right? I was a monk. I always know who did it because oh, he's a. I know him from something else. If he's on the show, obviously he's the killer, right? But wouldn't it be great if life came with the, whether it be a happy moment, you've made the right choice and the music changed, or wouldn't it, gentlemen? When you, you met that lady and the music changed to the Jaws theme? I mean, you were only 17 and she came into your life and you're like, oh, hi. And you went, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo, doo -doo. And you would know, get away from her! <laughs> but life doesn't come with theme music. Most of the time, you don't even realize the pivotal decisions, right? Until years Decades later. Did you look back at some of you that are older? And you know who you are. You're older and you look back in your life and you can look back right now and you think, man, that was a pivotal decision. The day I went to that party, the day I met him, the day I, I that was my life pivoted for good or for bad on that decision. There are three young people, especially, 
three life-changing decisions you will make. Number one, who you marry. Don't believe me? Spend some time with married people. Who will you marry? Young ladies, you, you, you want to send your children down a life of, of, of sort of spiritual darkness? Find a guy who's really not serious about this whole Jesus thing. And that's what you'll do. Uh, young men, you want to find somebody who can be there as a pillar in a, in a better half of your life? Marry the person who's not the cutest. Marry the person who Jesus wants you to marry. What you do. Some of you right now, you are dreading tomorrow. Because you get up and you have to go to a job and you hate it. Why? Because you chose to be involved in it. And see, I've seen this. I've seen this in the vice president of banks. And I've seen it in janitors. The happy or the sad, both of them. And some of you young people, you are thinking this. And I listen to me. You are thinking, I will be really happy if I can do something that makes me six figures, a lot of money, and all this other stuff. That's my whole goal is to do that. And you will find yourself miserable because you are not doing what makes you happy. Amen. Amen. Make Jesus and the decision to accept Christ and then the decision to surrender your life to whatever He wants. Make that your life pivoting moment today. In Luke chapter 18, we meet a man who has a life changing moment with Jesus. And we're going to see four things about my one moment with Jesus and how it can ultimately change everything about me. But there's some things about that one moment. Look at verse 35 about this man. And it came to pass that as he was coming, come nigh to Jericho, this is Jesus, a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. And they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passed by. Listen, all of the things about Jesus, there was no CNN or Fox News or anything like that or the internet, but everyone in that area had started to hear about the man who went to funerals and broke up the funeral. They started to hear about the man who was putting arms and eyesight and, and lepers were no longer the same and he was healing people. Everyone was hearing about this man who was changing lives. And so this man had heard the saying, here he is, a poor blind beggar. And what does he do in verse 38? And he cried, saying, Jesus, thou son of David. He recognized that he was descended. He was the next. He was the Messiah. He could sit on David's throne. I realize for a lot of us, you be over that son of David, you think nothing about that. But for a Hebrew at this time who was looking for the Messiah, that was a big thing to say. The son of David, have mercy on me. My one moment with Jesus, number one, happens with people you don't expect. The religious culture of the day that Jesus was operating in, they saw people with physical affirmities as basically getting what they deserved. In fact, in most cultural religious settings, whether you go into Hindu or anything else, most religious systems, when there's a person who's deaf or blind and has a physical abnormality, when they see them, they see them as people getting what they deserve. In fact, think about the Good Samaritan. Those two religious people walked away from this poor uh, uh, Samaritan or poor Jewish man beaten up, left on the side of the road for dead because they did not want to defile themselves or they had religious obligations and they didn't have time with them. In fact, Jesus' own disciples, there would be another sort of situation just like this. And these religious people that the disciples were at that time, listen... You don't need religion. Religion is evil. Religion flies planes into towers. Religion isolates people. You need a relationship with God through Jesus Christ. Amen? Guys, yeah. listen. This is one of the most strangest things you'll ever hear Pastor Steve say. I don't want you to be a Baptist. I want you to be a Christian. That's right. Amen? Amen? But if you really love Jesus, come to a Baptist church. But, <laughs> total joke. Come on. But Jesus and his disciples, they'll be walking around and seeing another situation just like this. And his disciples will ask this question of a man who's lame and who is limp and you know, handicapped. And they'll say, who sinned? This man or his parents sinned? And Jesus is just blown away by this. He says, no, 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 no. This was done for a purpose in that situation. But here, this man is not only blind, but he's a beggar. How many amazing stories... How many amazing people that God has brought into our life to minister, to be part of our lives, have we lost out on? Because they didn't quite fit our sort of sociological need. 
They didn't look quite like us. One of the obstacles in your Jesus moment and having a life-changing moment will happen in you will be with people you didn't expect it to take place with. Amen? Amen. So, that's what the crowd does. Look back at verse 39. And they went before and rebuked him that he should hold his peace. How do you do that? How do you tell a blind beggar, a poor man, who Jesus the miracle worker walking through their presence, how do you tell him, shut up, you're bothering everyone, be quiet? How do you do that? You know how you do that? You do that because you're blinded by religion. Verse 39. And what does he do? He cried more, much more. Thou son of David, have mercy on me. My one moment with Jesus, number two, will have obstacles. It will have obstacles. This man could have easily done, listen to me young people, this man could have easily done what the crowd was demanding him to do. This man could have bent to peer pressure and done what everyone wanted him to do. He could have bent to what society at the time was telling him to do. Shut up and be quiet. Sit down and stop talking. He could have very easily, take listen, he could have accepted the role he had for his life. He could have done that. But instead, he shouted louder, Jesus have mercy on me. Young people, don't think serving God will be easy. Choosing to go against the crowd, choosing to go against peer pressure, society, what everyone expects you. Everyone expects your goal in life to be money. Everyone expects you to do what it takes for you to have a good time and for your entire life to be what? YOLO. You only have one life, Pastor Steve. And that's one of the biggest obstacles that this generation has. That they look at their life as what? What I can do about me. I should, I should get as much money as I can have. I should travel because it's about me experiencing my life. Yo, I should have sex with as many people as possible. Because these are all experiences that I should enjoy. And I should get high. Because why? Because it makes me feel good. My entire life is YOLO. It's all about me. Young people, make this determination. Leave a mark on the world without a scar. And there will be obstacles for you to serve God. And one of the biggest obstacles you will have is the peer pressure and the crowd telling you, this is what your life should be about. And you want to go against the flow? Go against the flow by instead of, listen, instead of when you graduate, I'm going to spend a, a couple years in Europe. I'm going to spend a couple years just getting high. I'm going to spend, spend a couple years serving Jesus on a foreign mission field. And Jesus stood and commanded him to be brought unto him. And he, when he was come near, he asked him, saying, what wilt thou that I shall do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I may receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, Receive thy sight, thy faith has saved thee. My one moment with Jesus, number three, requires me to be ready. What if Jesus had asked him, What do you want? And he said, Oh, oh, um, I wasn't ready for you to ask me, Jesus. Um, but wait, give me a second. I need to think about this. Hold on a second. And the crowd just sort of keeps Jesus going. What if he's not ready? What if Jesus wanted you to do something? Are you ready? Is your life ready? What's your response going to be? I can't help but think that when the rapture occurs, there's going to be a lot of people say, well, hold on a second, Jesus. i got a few more things to do. Is your relationships ready? Are you ready to say goodbye? Because that may take place at any moment. Are you ready for eternity? Young people, life is about preparing for amazing events. But they will pivot on one decision. Every addict had one decision where they started to use drugs. Every person got a disease because they chose that one decision. One decision to sleep with that person. One decision to use that needle. One decision. Every person married the wrong person. Because they made one wrong decision. And what I want you to do here today to keep you from some of those bad decisions is basically say here. Here am I, Lord. Here am I. Send me. I'll tell you what, that, that simple thought will keep you out of debt. It will keep you clean. It will keep you sober. It will help you marry the right person. Amen? But that's not the goal. The ultimate goal here, though, is that my one moment has a purpose. And here is that one moment. Verse 43. And immediately he received his sight and followed him. And glorified God. And all the people when they saw it gave praise unto God. My one moment with Jesus, number four, points others to Jesus. Points others to Jesus.
everyone wants a miracle, it seems. Everyone sort of thinks they need a miracle in their life, but it seems that so few people get that miracle. If you're taking notes, miracles from God point people to God. Praise more. Praise more. Maybe this is a good checklist for you right now to decide, are you saved? Do you know Christ? Have you had that miracle relationship, that life, one spiritual life-changing moment with Jesus? I follow Him closely. I praise Him loudly, verbally, but with my life. And I just crave to be more with Him. Maybe it's a good reminder. Maybe it's a wake-up call. Maybe you got a great religion, but you don't have a relationship. Today, as we sort of close, I want to talk about one person whose life made a huge scar on humanity. Adolf Hitler. Now, as I talk about Hitler, of course, I don't think there's very few people in here who would have a positive view of him. And if you do, you need help. We need to talk. But he had, had life-changing moments that made him who he was. But one of the things about Hitler and the Nazis were the crowds. Um, the Nazis, before anybody else, probably used propaganda better than anyone. And they made movies and imagery and sort of all sorts of things that they did better than anyone. And it was the crowds. And young people, you can be stuck in a bad crowd. You can be stuck in a bad situation. And it doesn't have to change you. You can be with a whole group of people that just sort of... You're stuck because you go to school with them, and maybe everybody on your, your team smokes weed. You don't have to smoke weed. And young ladies, you can be stuck in a classroom of girls who think giving their virginity away means nothing. You don't have to be just like them. In the midst of a crowd who says, hey, YOLO, you only live life once. Do as much as you can. You can be a Christ follower, someone who knows Jesus, and you can be completely exempt from what they're doing. There's a picture of a crowd of Hitler. And somebody noticed this man inside the crowd. And, and, and if you backed up even further, you would see it's a, it's a road and Hitler's driving down on the crowd. And, and people, as he goes by, are giving him that you know, infamous Nazi salute that they used and overtook. But somebody found and noticed in this picture this man circled. Let me zoom in a little bit closer. In a crowd of thousands of thousands of people, he was the only one who decided not going to go along with it. Now, he didn't have a banner that said, Down with Hitler. He didn't, probably doesn't look like he's talking to other people. And he's forced to be there on the side of the road, forced to be part of the crowd, and he chooses just not going to salute. Young people, you can go with the crowd. You can be what everybody else thinks your life is supposed to be. You can YOLO your life. Or you can go against the crowd. This man in Luke 18 went against the crowd. Life-changing moments. But see, going with the crowd is easy. Because nobody circles all the people in this picture except for the one guy who said, I'm going to be different. I'm going to stand out. Life changing moments. As you look back on your life, where would your life be without Jesus? How much different would your life have been if you made one life-changing decision to make Jesus your Lord and Savior? Every head bowed and every eye closed.